What is going on, guys? Welcome to the Wednesday night live stream. Today, we have Adam and Robert on from BRS. How are you guys doing today? Great. Good, man. Great, great, great. I'm excited. We have Adam this time, my yep. uh, partner in crime here, man. Me exactly. and this guy spend a lot of time together, a lot of virtual time together. A lot of virtual time. <laughs> so most people probably indirectly know Adam. You, you, yeah. You're definitely behind the keyboard most of the time. So people probably oh, know yeah. you, but they probably don't really see you. So it, it's awesome to finally have you on. So yeah, welcome. more than just a profile picture now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's almost 3D. Uh, yeah. that, that's a weird, funny thing. I think all the pandemics, if you like see someone in real life, you're like, you're so realistic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so working at home for me was like that. It was like, man, a real human. <laughs> like, I'll get out of my house. like I go to the grocery store just to like go talk to the clerk sometimes. <laughs> it's like I'm around kids and myself all the time. <laughs> yep. oh, hello, real person. Yeah. Just sneak in those tiny conversations. Keeps you sane. Right. Yeah. Yep. All right. So Adam, you have a reef tank right behind you. I like it. Yeah, it's uh, you know just a little frag tank. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing special. Uh, I'm sure people have seen my more impressive display tank uh, on Facebook and whatnot. This is mm -hmm. kind of just the holding tank until I can get rid of all the frags that come out of the main tank. So it's, it'll be there forever because it just keeps happening. Adam yeah, it's pretty much. Keep a very meticulous display tank. It is super, mm -hmm. super beautiful. Yeah, Love I try. My, my diamond <laughs> gold helps. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it definitely does. Now, does he throw sand all over your corals on your sand bed and other places, or is he fairly well behaved? So I've made it a point to not put any corals in the sand bed, uh, so I don't have that will. problem. <laughs> That's some solid willpower. Yeah, yeah. I've said it, but they always end up down there, so, you know. But he's got one of those tanks where it's like, uh, their corals are big, and they're nice, and they're pretty. He doesn't have, mm -hmm. like, a frag farm. He's got, like, some nice, mature, pretty corals, and it's clean. It's just a really great look, man. I like it every yeah. time I see it. Few, fewer <laughs> corals, but bigger corals. That's where it's at. Yep, totally. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. So many tanks these days are just, like, seas of frags. It's, it's nice to see, like, some substantial size colonies kind of grow. Yeah, like 50 head uh, hammer. That, yep. That's, like, my pride and joy. How many gallons is your main tank? Oh, it's just a 75. Yeah, that's, that's, it's pretty full. Yeah, yeah, the hammer's pushing up against the front glass, so I need to do something about it soon. <laughs> yep. Uh, that's awesome. Um, now, today I was thinking it'd be kind of fun if we talked a little bit like tools of the trade, you know, conventional or unconventional, you know, maybe we'll talk about some cool ideas, you know, Christmas coming up. If you want to buy yourself something fun from Santa or you get your reefer spell something cool, there's kind of some different ideas of stuff that, you know, what do we like, what do we use, and what's some kind of cool potential stuff maybe you don't think about using for reefing. So kind of good one to get the stuff started. Love it. Let's Ooh, do it, man. Exactly. Um, now, a couple ones. Okay, so since we were talking about the frag tank behind you, um, on the frag side of things, is there any non-conventional tools that you use for fragging or creating frags? Adam first. What do you got? Uh, I would say the only tool that I would that maybe is unconventional would be mm -hmm. uh, like a Dremel. Uh, yeah. I don't have a fancy uh frag saw or anything like that I, I just can't justify it with how infrequently i frag so, but a, a dremel with a really good cutting wheel is something that mm -hmm. i really enjoy using I, ha I haven't actually tried it but you can buy little like diamond wheels for dremels too for like yep. five bucks and then yeah, yeah probably yeah. Exactly. halfway those, to man. a saw so i use i use the harbor freight like rotary mm -hmm. tools what they call it just inexpensive um and then you can order the diamond bits on like amazon or ebay and stuff and they work great man they burn mm -hmm. out pretty quick but um they work yeah. you know they make a clean cut yeah um, well, and garden dollar... shears i've used garden shears because you know like you're stainless steel they still rust man you mm -hmm. spend more like you get fancy coral ones you spend more money on them so i've bought in garden shears and just <laughs> make sure i dump them in water and they work if you gotta frag a bunch of acros they work um nice but yeah that's about it you know with um, with bone cutters, there's like the stainless steel chrome looking ones, and then there's right. usually like a black anodized one. Have you found ones more resistant to rust over the other? You just gotta. I, I guess I haven't. Uh, yeah. The key though is like just dunk it in fresh water when you're done with it and dry it off. Like mm -hmm. that's. Rinse and dry. <laughs> that's yeah. the only way you're gonna stop rust. Yep, yeah. Rust, I think. Yeah. It's true. Anything salt water, definitely good rinse is very very important. Um, now gluing, um, that's another one we were talking about earlier. So dollar yep. store glue, reef glue, what do you, what do you go for? I'm a dollar store guy. <laughs> yeah. Polyp Labs glue is my, is my go-to. Go-to? Nice. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's obviously more expensive than dollar store, but I feel like, 
I, I don't know. It's just uh, can, it's it's like a, an ease of use thing. Um, I don't I don't want to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't, don't want to struggle with like this uh, watery glue. I just I just want to use it. I want it to do the job and you know call mm -hmm. it. Yep, someone's here. Uh, yeah, I know the original one I used to use in Square by back in the day was the Gorilla Glue, like the green top one. That's the gel, which worked well, but it always left like a weird, like sticky film on the surface. And you get it on your hand and it's annoying, or your fish are trying to eat it, and you're like, get away from the glue, shooting away. Yeah. And then I find most of the reef glues don't leave that film on the surface like the other ones do. So that's kind of one thing that I kind of found with it. Um, Polyplab one's been super solid. Ecotech one works really well. It's super thick. Um, Polyplab one's great because they're just, you don't have to worry about the tip afterwards. It's basically single use yeah. ones. But. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest mm -hmm. tip I think with glue is the single use things, man. Um, <laughs> it's just far easier to buy to buy the little tiny tubes. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the thing is, is, is the average reefer is not gluing 100 frags at a time. Yeah, you know, we're, yeah. We're gluing one, two, maybe 10 frags at a time. And I, I don't want to have to like keep unclogging the tip of the glue or have to buy new tips or you know any of that crap i just want to i just want to be able to open a new one it work right away and you know mm. toss it when i'm done with it yep good way i know i know some glues will come with extra tips and i mean that's not the workaround too if you buy the big ones just sure. make sure you don't get those babies wet yeah yeah that's <laughs> Yes. Yeah, and and if you're if you're gluing underwater, make sure that the tube is metal and not the the plastic, uh, because you know if you are gluing underwater and you let go of the plastic bottle, mm. it's gonna suck all the water in to the tube. So that's why I like the metal tubes. Ah, that's actually a really good point. Never considered it before. Solid. Um, I like it. Okay, uh, test kits. What are your go-to ones? I get this asked this one constantly. Which ones to buy? Yeah. Which ones to get? It's a big one. It is a big one. What are what are your favorites? What do you find works the best? Or actually, which ones? Whatever it means. Which ones do you use? Which ones do you buy? What, what do you refill for? That's the better question. I'll put Robert on the spot first on this one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I use a mix for sure. Um, so I'll kind of go through the different brands. Which ones? Uh, actually, I think I have my box right here. Yeah, I do. So I got I got the Hanna stuff right here. But mm -hmm. for Hanna, uh, I'll use the the phosphate checker, alkalinity checker. Um, I do use their digital salinity pen, not the refractometer, yep. not the big like Milwaukee or Hanna. The big one I'll use just mm -hmm. the pen. Yeah, that yep. one right there. Good choice. Um, and then I, I use their it's called a combo pen, but I use it for pH, TDS, and temperature. It's kind mm -hmm. of my checker pen because I can use the TDS for my RO water temperature for both the tank and whatever else you need it for mixing mixing water yep. um and then the ph is can go both ways you know you can you can test it in the the fresh or salt water and it's nice i think it's like 130 140 it's expensive for a handheld pen but at the same time it's got a replaceable electrode you get all three of them and now you've got a handheld meter to test you know everything i like to spot check ph you know check i use i can use it to check uh, thermometers temp controllers that kind of stuff mm -hmm. uh, so i love that one i think i've been through Gosh, in the 15 years I've had a reef tank, um, nice Coffee. bonus. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I've been through four of them, man. Four of those mm -hmm. Hanna pens, because I I just got one, a new one recently, and that's I'm pretty sure the fourth one. Uh, and they're waterproof, so that's that's cool too. You can drop them in the water, or do whatever. You just yeah, be very careless with them. <laughs> they're and they're fine. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so those are the, the HANA stuff that I use. And then for essentially just calcium, it's kind of really the only one I monitor closely is I'll use this Alfred kit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Red Sea kits are kind of nice, but uh, I just, I learned on Salford, so I'm just kind of used to it. I go to it. They're affordable. They've always worked just fine for me. Um, and if, uh, you know, I would, I, for phosphate, I will use a Salford as a backup too. So there's mm -hmm. there's that one um nitrate i don't really test too much i've just i've you know i kind of do a visual thing with that i can just kind of tell you get a pulse of your tank and you can kind of tell where you're at with that after a while so i t t don't really test it all that often maybe once in the beginning at the cycle before i'll do like that initial water change um mm -hmm. and that's really again just an indication i mean <laughs> i've used api kits for that for a long time just because yeah. i've always had them around and it just gives me that okay am i really high or am i low you know, mm -hmm. if I get, you know, minimal color change, it's low. If I get a huge color change, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to do a, you know, 40, 50, 60 percent water change um, before, you know, I'm ready to add fish. So that's kind of the, the most, really, that's all I use, just the hand in the cellar and those those major key parameters. Um, 
So I got salinity, pH, and temp covered, and then, yeah, calcium milk. Magnesium, I guess, that one again, yeah, I think salifert's the only one that I'll, I'll keep on hand for that. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, no, no, I've no, I don't keep a, a Red Sea magnesium one, just salifert. Okay. I've never yeah. actually used most of those salifert ones, so I've only used the salifert elk one, so it's good to know. You like them. Yeah, I, so... I work with them, so it's like the old dog new tricks thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm... Uh... So for the like, initial cycle stuff, um, the Red Sea is what I've typically used. Mm-hmm. I don't, I honestly don't test that much during the, the initial cycle. I just kind of let the tank do its thing. Um, I, for nitrates, I do like the NIOS kit. I, it's just easier to see the color change, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I honestly don't test nitrates very often at all. Um, just I do pretty large weekly water changes, so it's just not an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm with Robert on the the Hanna Elk, uh, Hanna Phosphate. Um, I'm using the Phosphorus ULR right now. Uh, I bought it before the Phosphate one came out. Otherwise, I'd probably own that one. Okay. Um, yeah, Hanna Salinity uh, Pen. And then for major elements, uh, we've got the Hanna for Elk. I would say Red Sea for Calcium and mm-hmm. Magnesium as well. I know a lot of the guys at BRS are a big fan of the Aquaforest uh, Mag Kit, so I might try that out. But mm-hmm. um, for now, that's about it. The uh, Hannah also has uh, the check temp um, thermometer. Yep. Oh yeah. So whenever I need to calibrate things, I usually just borrow the one at work because it's so infrequent. Yep. Um, but other than that, I use the Apex for the pH. Um, so you know, just calibrating that every so often. I really mm-hmm. like having a constant pH monitor. So I. I I don't like the pH, uh, the pH pens like like Robert was mentioning just because I actually have to test it. I would rather just have the the Apex and have it mm-hmm. send me an alarm if something's off. Yeah, well, it, it's a solid way to go. Um, I'm pretty close to you on most of those. So Hanna, I use for alkalinity and phosphates. I don't remember which one I have. Um, <laughs> I've, I have the one U times of by point zero. Oh no, it tells me the PPM. Um, so the phosphate one. Phosphate. So that, That's phosphate. Yep. Yeah. That one I use. Um, I I do like the Red Sea ones because I think they're the most economical. I guess like they're the refills are cheap. Yeah. So long term, it's a good way to go. Um, Hanna for salinity pen. That one's just so easy and nice and waterproof and does temp and all that stuff on as well. And I did get one of those like whatever these are called the like calibrated NIST ones. I and it's actually ask you about, yep, yep. it is Have pretty dang close. That? Yeah, I was gonna say I yes. want. I've never used that one. I've always been interested in that one versus because I've always used the Hannah one. Mm-hmm. Um, and that yeah. one's like certified. I'm curious, Adam specifically, because I know you've probably used both of them. Is do you find any difference, or like would you rely on either of those more so, or do you think? It's, uh, uh, I, I would. I'd put them in the same category in terms of accuracy. Um, uh, yeah, the, right <laughs> I would say that the um, so the Hannah check temp. Uh, I I just like. I don't know. Uh, it's it's not NIST certified, but it's it's compared to uh, a machine that is. I think right. is the is the deal. Yeah. Um, I would I would trust either of them equally. Um, and and like Devin's uh, gonna demonstrate here, the the salinity pen from Hanna actually does have a temperature feature in it too. Yeah. Um, it's a little less accurate than the check temp. I think mm-hmm. the the pen is like plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit. Uh, the check temp is half a degree Fahrenheit. So right. it's a, it is, I guess it just depends on the level level of precision that you're that yeah. you're after. Yeah. Okay. Twenty four point one, twenty four point three. So they're point two away from each other. So pretty yeah. darn close. At the end of the day, point two doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. And it's, that's, it's, not... that's Celsius too, so it's <laughs> yeah. a bigger. That's a bigger a bigger uh, degree range there. Sorry. Uh, one more uh, one more test kit that I'll mention that I forgot to uh, <laughs> to say initially. Uh, Hannah for copper also. Mm-hmm. If you're quarantining. Oh yeah. Hannah copper checker mm-hmm. is oh. fantastic. That is the only way to go. When I was quarantining stuff, I could not tell the color of any. I bought two different copper tests, and they're garbage. Like I couldn't read them. I'm like, I have no idea what the copper is. So I bought yeah, the Hannah one. Yeah, it's so important. Hundred percent. All right, and that's what brings up a good point too: is the Seachem ammonia badge. That mm-hmm. is a good one for your your yeah. uh, QT tank. I mean, it's you know, I think most of us have got a handle on biofiltration and and that kind of stuff. So the risk of ammonia is pretty slim. Um, I never monitor it during a cycle in a display or anything, but. Mm-hmm. I recommend it all the time because I think it's a great thing to have and people freak out about ammonia. So <laughs> if anything, yeah. it's a peace of mind. It's like a visual peace of mind that, you know, you're not putting your fish in a toxic environment. Well, mm-hmm. especially in a QT tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. 
<clears throat> quarantine tank is 100 percent where they shine and then analog refractometer i always keep those around man um yeah. i just trust them i you know i know inside and out how to reference and calibrate those things i know yep. you know what i mean it's like you can tell right away if, if something's wrong with that thing you can throw mm -hmm. the 35 solution on it get it calibrated up and so if i start seeing wonky readings on that digital one which does happen mm -hmm. from time to time um i'll stick them both with the reference solution and uh you know cal calibrate them up um, yeah. so that's why i like to have that refractometer on that's for sure okay R random pro tip for test kits i bought one of these little tool organizers yeah there you go I need to do that. <laughs> it's so easy right because rather than yeah. like even the handle they have those big boxes right everything just goes in here i pull up my one little case and <laughs> little for every case test kit. Kevin? well big little case, case. <laughs> B big case but your you're suitcase? like it's like oh yeah i need to test meg okay here's all my meg test kits right like it just yeah. makes it really easy. Oh, you're right um lamont used to make some pretty nice little uh plastic boxes and i think red sea makes a plastic box too i'm not sure if they they give it to you anymore but i know the original ones did mm -hmm. um but it was a nice small compact box that came with everything so those were nice and i still actually have a couple that i keep around um it's Assume everything fits back in the box. So. There's that issue. <laughs> that's, that's funny you bring that up because uh, uh, Randy actually did a BRS TV video on how to fit the Red Sea <laughs> things back into the into the plastic case. Like that's we hilarious. do get that question all the time. Well, it's the it's the freaking syringe holder, man. You got to put that thing like in, in the this one thing. spot vertical. Yeah. Trying to fit those back in is a pain. Yeah. In the... yeah. yeah. So true. Um, okay. How often? A couple actually good questions came by in the chat, so we'll get to those in a second. How often do you calibrate your selenium checker? Uh, salt. <laughs> Basically, I put it in solution every time I mix. So oh, I'll, seriously? I'll, I yeah, don't I'll calibrate it uh, nearly that much. Um, I probably calibrate mine every two months, um, okay. which is less than Hannah recommends. But every oh, time I calibrate, it's never off by more than one PPT, yeah. if even that. And I should say this. I don't calibrate every time. Okay. I check it. So I just stick it. it in 35 PBT. If I'm on point, um, even, you know, a minor variance, I'll still just go ahead and mix it. Okay. I, it's hard for me to say how often I have to calibrate it, but it's pretty rare, man. Maybe yeah. like two, three times a year. The one <clears> thing <throat> I will say about the, uh, the Hannah uh, uh, mm -hmm. Salinity pen is that it's so the the calibrate button and the power button are right next to each other uh, yeah. and always keep a packet of calibration solution on hand because if you accidentally hit the calibrate button i don't think there's a way to get out of the calibration step mm. and it, it like forces you to calibrate so i always make sure <laughs> i've got a packet on hand and maybe if someone in the chat can can correct me if there's a way to get out of the calibration but i i've done that a couple of times are you left or right-handed i'm right-handed okay yeah, fair. <laughs> I don't know why that's relevant. I'm just trying to think which, which thumb would be hitting which side of it. Yeah. Um, I haven't done that yet, but that is actually a really good point. So good, good to know. Yeah, I've done that twice so far. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's okay. on the same. It's got like one of those connected pads. So it's, yep. yeah, mm -hmm. it's pretty, pretty if easy. If you're not paying do. attention, it's easy to do. No, yeah. so true. Okay. Aaron is asking, how much do you trust your test kits compared to an ICP test? <laughs> I trust them more. More than ICP? Yeah. Well, for um, well, the things that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously for, you know, cyanide and metals and stuff, of course I'm going to trust that. Yeah. But I don't test for that in my tank. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, in all honesty, man, like I I would use an ICP to, if, you know, I have a problem, I think mm -hmm. there's a contaminant, or just things are, you know, I cannot figure out an issue. Like things are just, have been wrong, going wrong for six months. I'm doing everything I know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to, you know, kind of verify that uh, what I'm doing is right. Um, but I've never really been in that boat uh, yeah. where I have to rely on ICP to like, oh, I can't wait for my ICP to get back here because it's going to tell me the answers to everything. It's more so, just a peace of mind thing. Yeah, I like to use ICP as a tool rather than uh, a crutch, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. for lack of a better way to say it. Um, it. You know, going back to stocking stuffers, that is a great one. Um, mm -hmm. I, it is nice to have a couple on hand just in case because you always run into those weird situations where you're, you just you you've checked everything or at least yep. everything you have test kits for. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like I, I have a lot of faith in myself being able to repeat like an alkalinity test mm -hmm. uh, over and over and get the same result. Um, whereas I bet if I gave Robert the same exact test, his result would be different than mine. And if I gave uh, Devin, if I give you the same exact test kit, you know, your result would probably be a little different too. So mm -hmm. 
I, yeah, I guess I'm only using ICP if there's a problem that, you know, is I got to call on the big guns, so to speak. Yeah, I think one thing, well, too, even with people testing differently, the biggest thing is that you can test the same way, right? You know, even yep. if we all get different numbers, are we consistent with the numbers that we get, right? Exactly. Uh, that, that's that's the biggest thing to see if yep. you're actually like legit staying on target or if you're just willy nilly all over the place every yeah. time. Yeah. I'm big on trace. Sorry, Adam. Um, um, I'm big on trace elements. So that's actually one thing I would key in with ICP and what I do get curious about every so often. Mm -hmm. um, if I've got something that I can't get the color I want or it's just not growing like I thought it would or I want it to, um, I will check trace elements. Um, I sometimes <laughs> I feel like I overdose them, um, but usually ICP, you know, trace elements tend to like get used up and, um, you know, I'm more scared of not having a trace element or a minor element than overdoing it because mm. it's like the, the way I feel is like it's not going to have a huge effect because it's such a small amount, like in terms of chemistry and, you know, pH and stuff. Um, yep. And I just want to ensure that it's available because. I am convinced that there is some process. So there's something in, you know, there's something in this, you know, this corals processes that needs that element or it's evolved some way to use that. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I've just always found or done better um, by ensuring that those trace elements are always in the water. So I no, think that's yeah. the biggest benefit for Do me. you test yeah. them? ICP. No. Do you well, test? ICP, that's <laughs> not it. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I've done like a strontium test. I've done an iodine test, and it's just they're so difficult, and it's so like, it's just kind of like, oh, cool, I did an iodine test, <laughs> and now what do I yeah. do with that information? ICP, on the other hand, I can be like, okay, um, you know, these four are showing, you know, are showing red, um, and then I can target them with specific elements, or just go in and you know, a couple big water changes, maybe dump a um, a comprehensive like trace element supplement if it's something that's in there. Um, or, you know, if it's something like, uh, you know, one of the minor elements that you're going to get, um, and like, you'll get them in your calcium solution, uh, or magnesium solutions, uh, you know, I can, I can address that specifically and get an additive for that. Mm -hmm. Nope. That's a good way to go. Now I would agree. Like main thing too, like with an ICP test, if something is off in your tank, right, you have no idea what it's a good way to see if there's some contaminant in there. And the other big benefit that I kind of see is if you are going down the trace element rabbit hole, because they are harder to test for, and most people don't have a bazillion tiny test kits. Yeah, exactly. So if you're going to start regularly dosing them, like I kind of dose them randomly. I'm like, oh, I'll do a couple capfuls whenever I think of it, right? So yeah, you know, exactly. Week it's like every couple days, another week, it might be a week before I do it. So I might put them on a doser. Then I might actually do like a couple months of ICP just to make sure what I've set the doser yeah. up isn't extremely overdosing it i guess more than anything well but. and uh, so I'll, I'll probably use a lot of brs examples just because that's you know the world i come from but yeah um uh the the brs and tropic marin uh hybrid falling method i guess if you want to call it that uh with their <laughs> yeah nice um so Bonus. part C uh, for like the ionic balance of, of you know, the, the two part, mm -hmm. but more importantly for trace elements, um, uh, the A and K from Tropic Baron, like you can just mix that in with your BRS two part um, and you don't need a separate dosing head. You can just, you know, add it in and, and it just gets added for you with your uh, alkalinity or calcium. Mm -hmm. No, true that. Now, so then, so, I would uh, with that. Use yeah, yeah, with that to, to test yep. them. Adam, yep. uh, so with the hybrid balling method, so you mix your, your A and your K, but then the component C would um, would still have to go separately. You can't mix out with anything, right? Correct, yeah. So you would C need three separate. heads. You, you would, at minimum, you need three dosing heads to get it Three automated. dosing heads, uh, four if you wanted to automate uh, magnesium, mag, right? but honestly, uh, I would say for most people, you can, Once a month you can dose mag by hand, or even you can dose the part C by hand, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. It's just a lot. I think you're getting because you're doing like a double what your uh, your calcium and alpha dose is. Yeah, yeah. I guess M mag takes a lot though, and it takes a long time to change. Oh my gosh, so it's, mag. It's, you can ignore it for ages. I dealt with this guy last week had a 180 gallon tank, and he was like, I think he was down at just over a thousand. And he yeah. he asked me if he's like, do I really need to dump in this much? Yes. It was yeah. like close to a gallon of solution, you know, yep. per our calculator. I checked it three times just to make sure. And I did like I worked backwards and did the math that way, and sure enough, man, he needed a ton of solution to get adjusted, and it's just the way that it is. Yeah, big jump, big tank. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I always find it crazy too when you're dumping just liters or gallons well, of it. You're like, well, when you it's a big adjustment. Too, but like Adam, you know this, the dry material of mag, like you're adding a ton of dry material. It's like six or seven <laughs> cups or something per yeah, gallon. You, it's uh yeah you kind of think to yourself i don't know if this is gonna dissolve in a gallon yeah of am i gonna like make no. <laughs> slushy here or something <laughs> now the trick to dissolving it one if your water is slightly warmer helps it but two stirring it sucks magnetic stirs yes <laughs> awesome reefer stocking stuffer Very these cool. are like pretty inexpensive they're like 20 30 bucks but having a magnetic stirrer you just add your water you dump in your mag stuff let it do its thing for like 10 15 minutes fully I'm dissolved Versus, that I love. Yeah, or <laughs> even for testing, um, oh, yeah. they they make the the little tiny vials or uh, even smaller magnetic stirrers too. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're doing the titration test kits, like man, I you got to spend the twenty bucks and get one of those. They're awesome. Yeah, yeah so I, with that, I use this too for that. Beakers, man, graduated nice. cylinders. These things are the best. You don't lose the measurements on them. Mm -hmm. uh, they stick around forever. You can keep them clean. You can do a wide range of measurements from, you know, what says 20 mLs all the way up to 250 mLs. So it's big. Oh, I guess you guys can't see. There it is. And then I got this little tiny one from my little stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can use your magnetic stirs. You're not knocking it over because it has the big bottom on it. This one has the plate on it. I love I've these broken things. many of those tall ones. And there's like there's like bulk <laughs> scientific material websites. Like you can you can get expensive ones. Like if you're buying like Pyrex brand name. But you can actually find them uh, fairly decently priced. Um, and, you know, you, you just need a couple of them. It's not like you need a whole ton of them, um, as long as you're inching them and stuff. So yeah. that's a good one. I think any reefer could use something like that. <laughs> I'm I'm a fan of the nice big, like, beaker ones, too. I, and I use those for mixing up stuff. Like, I have the Elkatronic. I use it for my elk reagent. I use it for mixing up magnesium or any, like, the more bulk stuff I'm dosing. Yeah. With the little magnetic stir, pff, way to go, 100%. Yep, absolutely. Yep. But yeah, the stir, amazing. And you just get the super tiny pill. And like, this is my red sea test kit for like magnesium yeah. and some of the ones like that where you got it. It's like, oh, shake it for a minute. I'm like, yeah, yeah turn up the dial. I was going to say, uh, are you using that to do your test when you do it? Yeah. Yep. I, um, the Hannah, I don't, but the red sea ones that have like the bigger vials, I have a little tiny one. Oh, I actually yeah, stole the one of the little, tough. Yeah. Yeah. I stole one of the reef bot ones, the super tiny little pill that I throw that in my. I think we, uh, we have one, I'm pretty sure. Let's see. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, I think uh, I can't remember if it's uh, Auto Aqua or I, I can't remember the brand. But it's uh, a tiny one, though. Yeah, some the Coral View's got one that's uh, that should be available soon uh, for like the Red Sea style kits. I know uh, Josh at uh, BRS who takes care of all like the BRS TV tanks. He's he's got one of the smaller ones. He's actually gotten so good at it where he's like he he does his Red Sea kit and it gets to like the you know stir for a minute or, or shake for a minute step. And mm -hmm. he's doing that. And then while that's going, he's doing the ALK test with the Hannah checker. And he's like, right. just, it's so much more efficient. <laughs> he's got a system. Yeah. We yeah. saw a GHL one, and it actually looks pretty small, too. Let's see the mm -hmm. I've never seen this one. No, so true. Oh, um, this connects This connects to your uh, your dosing pump. That's interesting. I've never seen this. Which one? It's not. Yeah, it's a GHL magnetic stir. I didn't realize mm. it was actually for your dosing pump. But I think we have another tiny one that's got, like, the little... There's like a um, a holder for the covet itself that's on top of it, so it can't oh, slide yeah. around. Yeah, yeah, I think, think you're right. Auto Aqua or one of those companies it makes it, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but they're nice. <clears throat> no, definitely. All right. So, okay. Another question that there was asked earlier: favorite ICP ICP testing brand? Do you guys find there's much of a difference between all the different companies, or are they all fairly similar? So, yes, there's a difference. We've we've sent out, you know. Uh, uh, an ICP test with the same water to mm -hmm. Triton and to ICP, ICP analysis. And they're different. I mm -hmm. mean, ICP testing salt water is incredibly hard. Um, the good thing is, is that when we've sent two samples to one brand, they're the same. Okay. That's what so, I'm going to ask next. Actually. So okay. if, basically what I'm saying is that if you're going to ICP test, use the same brand every mm -hmm. single time because right. you're going to get more consistent results that way. That makes and sense. it goes back to the, the, the testing thing. Like, I don't care if my alkalinity is seven or seven and a half, but mm -hmm. when I test it, like I want it to be consistent. Like every time okay. I test, I want to get the same result. Yeah. Something I tell people when uh, they're asking about ICP tests is kind of the experience level. Um, mm -hmm. because yeah, you know, ICP analysis is less expensive. Um, and you know, it's quick. It's here in the U S they do their thing, mm -hmm. but that experience when you get it back is definitely leave something to be desired when you've used a triton um yeah. a triton kit is like that experience is 
phenomenal. I mean, in terms of defining what you've got in front of you, explaining what you should do, why you should do it. Um, you know, it's easy to understand that interface. Uh, it's kind of straightforward. I get more questions. Uh, you know, every time you get that question of like, um, you know, can you guys help me interpret this? And it's like the, the, the periodic table of elements and it's got their, you know, it's, it's all colored and they don't know what they're looking at. Like that's always ICP analysis. Um, but you rarely get that from Triton. Uh, Mm Because they give you the list, and it's pretty self-explanatory where you need to click. And, um, you know, with the red, green, yellow uh, indication is, you know, kind of uh, universally understood. Yeah, Yeah, well, uh, and they give you direct advice, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, ICP gives you a certain level of advice, but it's not not usable and as direct and as detailed as you're going to get with Triton, for sure. If not, dose 10 mils of this concentrated supplement to correct it and then do a water change. Yeah, and I mean, that's part the triton uh system i was gonna say triton game but let's say mm-hmm. triton system <laughs> is they have the elements uh you know uh, individually mm-hmm. uh, and then you know they obviously have the triton method yep all right so talked about isp and talked about testing actually one tip that i actually got one of one of the brs streams which i've never considered but was storing the test kits with rodi water in them every time yep which <laughs> i might adopt that and start doing it oh what are we so talking nice. about I missed it. <laughs> Storing, doing what now? Yeah, um, so like okay. the Red Sea, uh, uh, you know, testing vials, they come with the caps or uh, HANA testing vials. Mm-hmm. Any, basically anything that oh, comes with the Oh, store the vial so it doesn't, yeah, I got you, I got you. Full of RODI water. Yep, Keeps it clean. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Like, I, I used to always just rinse them and let them dry out, but you still get little spots on it, right? And a couple yep. of rinses, you kind of get rid of it and got to scrub and make it good. Yep. If they are really nasty, and they do need a good cleaning. Um, ultrasonic cleaners work well for that. I have just a little cheap Amazon one I bought back before for cleaning my airbrush, but I use that to clean all my vials every you know six months or whatever. When That's they get idea. to that point to shine them up again, works really well. That is a good idea. Yep. Um, for other cleaning stuff, I mean, citric acid is always a huge one, that vin- or vinegar, or citric yep. acid water. That's kind of the go-to. I, I need yeah. to get some more, but citric <laughs> acid is something I almost always have on hand. No, okay, get, get this. This is completely, well, semi off topic, but I had a bunch of tools because I'm doing this big clean right now. It had bits of like surface rust and stuff on them. I threw them in citric acid overnight and the next day, like, literally, they were like almost new. Just gave them a little scrub after. That's such Shiny. amazing. Yeah. yeah. Not just for reefing gear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> does work well, man. It's good to have yeah. on hand. Yeah, it totally does. <laughs> Um, so doing that, um, big thing too, when you are doing your test kits is making sure they're like super clean, especially with ones like the HANA testers, right? Cause it's a little digital optical eye, a little color meter that's looking through the vial. So if there's smudges on it, that can cause issues, right? So it's good to have a little microfiber towel or something to clean things up. Yeah, for sure. And I, I wouldn't even use your shirt for a HANA tester. Like it might look like it's okay, but, um, all the time. yeah, I'm, I'm using the <laughs> microfiber like every single time because that's it's just you know one of the steps that you need to take to make sure you're getting an accurate result and if you don't then you know who knows maybe the, there was think... a smudge on there that was that was interfering that time that's not going to next time and you mm-hmm. know just one more uh way to get error i always go back to you know how like your tank will get those streaks on it that you can't wipe off like you can't even get them off with a windex <laughs> like you just will you will like wipe them for hours and it's always just like this white film i always think about that when i'm cleaning the hannah vials it's like nah i know it's on there so i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna rinse this thing with like vinegar and like you said microfiber and get it as polished as i can and then i'm holding it like this you know or i've got a bottle brush up inside of it and i'm not even touching it that's <laughs> a solid point actually even cleaning the tank of the glass sometimes like you know i'll use some kind of a spray cleaner and there will be a little streak sometimes and Legitly, like a few weeks ago, I did it and we went over the microfiber cloth and got like perfectly shiny, like near yeah. finish. But like you totally get streaks from all kinds of stuff. So no, and then you is... go from a different, like you're looking at it head on. You're like, oh, it's so pretty. And then you step two <laughs> feet to the left and you're on a different angle. And it's like, oh my God, there's a streak right there. <laughs> um, Tunsy Care Pains works really good. Uh, there's this one, it's an API tank cleaner, but it worked pretty good uh, way back in the day. But mm-hmm. nowadays, I, I like that Tunsy Care Pains. I got a bottle of it when they came out with it, and um, now I just pick it up whenever it's gone. It's good stuff. Yeah. Nice. It's awesome. It works uh, so well. Um, speaking of cloths, other big thing, too, if you're working on your tank, throw a towel on your floor. Always. Vent all those drips <laughs> and everything on the floor because you're likely going to spill water at some point. It happens. Yep. Towels uh, are very handy to have on hand, and then I also mm-hmm. use, um, well, so I used to have one of those, like, 
the thick foam like kneeling pads because you know you're down in your sump and you're always on your knees when you're working on the sump but now mm-hmm. i use a yoga mat so like i'll just lay it down um you know in front of the the tank stand when i'm working down there with the towel under it and then that way like you don't stress your knees out you don't stress your feet out if you're sitting down there or if you sit on your butt you know it's not like you're sitting on the floor forever because a lot of mm-hmm. times you can be down there for quite some time you know depending on what yep. you're doing um completely impractical for most people but how my tank is a peninsula and i took out the banister for the stairs so it's kind of the divider it is so nice to be able to stand on the stairs and work on things and not have to like <laughs> bend over that is definitely like a prime unforeseen oh you can benefit. access it from that one side that's funny yes it's <laughs> so nice <laughs> so nice because you just stand there like do do work it's on like things. at eye level it's when you're, you're working on your skimmer that is neat <clears throat> yeah so that's that was an unintended bonus of that not bending over <laughs> Um, so making things easy to access is a big one. Um, what else is good for cleaning stuff? Oh, acrylic sump. Um, I'm, cause I, have never had an acrylic tank because I'm paranoid of scratches. So acrylic sump, um, just for cleaning it once in a while, just from like algae and stuff, refugiums or those little white dot, the creatures that always get on your glass and stuff. So credit card or gift cards, whatever, those things work really well. It's not going to scratch it. Um, DC Reef from the comments is saying Mist- Magic Eraser, that does work well. Um, I have used that on sumps, I've got... acrylic, and glass as well. Yeah, oh, cool. if, uh, I like, uh, they just came out with um, uh, Magic Eraser sheets. Basically just mm-hmm. like super mm-hmm. thin uh, Magic Erasers. I use, uh, I use those to clean the inside hmm. of the tank every once in a while. Interesting. Yep. I just bought like a, a bulk pack of like 50 of them on I'm not sure my wife ordered it. I don't know if it was Amazon or something, but yeah, they're super nice, man. Use them on the fish tanks. Use them on everything, really. Door handles. They work great on door handles. You know, you get that kind of muck around your door handles, mm-hmm. door knobs. <laughs> they, they take that stuff off real quick. <laughs> yep. Cabinets. We use them on our cabinets a lot because we have kids and things get filled. Mm-hmm. It's Makes definitely sense. a lot. It's a lot easier and quicker than sitting there and scrubbing with, you know, four or uh, some cleaner, you know. Okay. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Random question. Do you wash your hands before you put them in the tank? Mm, hardly ever. Hardly yeah, ever. Say, do as I say, not as I do. So uh, it depends yeah, on what I was ever. doing beforehand. Mm-hmm. So like, if I'm if I'm out in the garage changing my oil, I'm gonna you know scrub my hands with Dawn or whatever really thoroughly. Yeah. Uh, if I'm just you know coming home from work, uh, and something needs to get taken care of, the hands just go right in the tank. <laughs> That's fair. Okay. Um, do you use gloves? I always, if, I've always noticed this, man. There's two, yeah, <laughs> neither do I. There's two, there's, there's two camps of reefers, and I don't know. I haven't figured out if it's, does it happen with time and experience, or is it just like you're just born this way and you don't want to touch, you know, you don't want to touch the creatures? Because I've met guys that have been keeping reef tanks for five, six, seven years, and they have beautiful tanks, and they will not stick their hands in the tank, like they they'll, they'll want the huge like coral life gloves. Um, or they're just like using tongs and, and like, I'm like, why is that coral on the ground? It looks like it's been there for like, you know, six months. Like it's growing on the glass. He's like, oh, well it fell and I don't want to get it. I'm just like, just pick it up. It's just like, like casualty of get it with the tongs, you know? <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, man. Um, so that's definitely something that's interesting. So if you have, you know, a, a fellow mm-hmm. reefer that doesn't like getting his hands wet, they have, you know, shoulder length gloves that you can wear. Um, and I mean, there is a certain level of, you know, danger factor to it, but you know. That's, I'm a da- I'm a danger ranger, man. I've never well, been. Yeah. Think about, think about all the the crazy types of bacteria that we have in our tanks and and things like that. Like wearing gloves is not. It's it, it is it is a good idea. Mm-hmm. I mean, if <laughs> if we're being you know frank about it, it's it is a good thing to do. And I've yeah. cut myself pretty bad on vermitid snails, uh, you know, mm-hmm. coral skeletons. Like I've definitely cut myself, and have have felt the effects of that cut for a solid 24 hours after I pull my hand out of the tank. Bristle Not worms got, got me one day. <laughs> that was recent, wasn't it? The bristle worm? <laughs> no, that I was sometime in the last few months. Worm. I've had a yep. rabbit fish. Rabbit fish hurt like hell. Um, mm-hmm. I was stung by a, um, a sculpin. This was on a boat in the ocean. Um, but they, I mean, it was painful as all hell. I sat, I just had to sit for the rest of this, you know, eight hour boat trip. Um, they say it hurts worse than a rattlesnake. I mean, I wouldn't know. I've never got bit by a rattlesnake, but I got hit mm-hmm. with one of these fish. It's a, it's a, a sculpin. It's a scorpion fish. And holy hell, does that hurt, man. It hurt bad. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> but the next day, it actually, it, it went away pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, you know, I think, I don't know if they, I did go to the doctor when I got back to the dock, but 
Um, I want to say they gave me a steroid, like some shot or something. Um, but it was like gone the next day. So that was kind of interesting. Yeah, well, this was gone. Off track, so, sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's, there's always sidebars. I, I just rinse with water most of the time. I try and rinse, you know, especially like if, you know, winter or someone has moisturizer, then it's a lot more important to try and rinse stuff off. True. I'm like, I never use like anything like that because I'm always like paranoid and I'm going to put it in the tank. But it is smart not to put your hands in, but my hands are in the way too much. Like, that's just never going to happen. I just know it. I, I just can imagine putting on these like massive. So let's say this what kind of soaps there. do you use? So Dawn is safe. Um, I think Cat has started selling some of that Reef Suds or some of that stuff we used to carry, mm -hmm. um, Adam. What is that bar soap we used to carry? Is it Reef Suds or so, Reef Suds? Uh, reef Suds, that, that was something that BRS used to carry. Um, yeah. Haven't seen it around. I don't know if the company is. Yeah, is still I think they stopped not, but... making it. I, I know they stopped making it, but Metro Cat actually started. I don't know I've if she's seen something about that. Yeah, actually. she started selling mm -hmm. it, um, or she picked some up, or something. I can't. I don't know how she got it, but um, it's the same brand because it's the same packaging. It's yeah. The same packaging um, seeing, so uh, the same Ryan stuff. Thompson from the the Ask BRS TV uh, oh, Facebook great. group, uh, he swears by unscented natural soaps. Yeah. Um, like, mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure where he gets his from, but I'm sure there are a bunch of different brands and yeah. sources out there. Yeah. I just use water. Yeah. And if my um, hands are really like just, nasty or working on a car, I'm like, eh, I'll deal with the tank tomorrow. Yeah, so I'll use like that orange zap or like the you know the gritty like grease soap. Mm -hmm. I definitely use that after working on the car or working on like in the yep. yard. I just used a chainsaw last weekend and I had to use that stuff. Um, but then I always go at it with Dawn because I cook a lot. So mm -hmm. sure. uh, yeah, like I'll go, I'll use Dawn. I mean that's just what we buy for dishes and everything, and I'm just adamant about always buying that. So that way we're just in a habit of you know everything gets Dawn, so it's safe, you know. And it cuts mm -hmm. it cuts grease really really well. So if multi purpose for sure. Yep. All right. Question from DC: Should you not clean the glass for a few days after adding pods to the display? Does the flipper scraper kill pods? I wouldn't think it would kill them. It would just kind of push them off, right? Because it's kind of a razor yeah. blade going along the edge. I I personally wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, um, I'm with you. I'm, I wouldn't be worried. Yeah. When when adding pods to a tank, um, especially if you got like a bottle of them, I would turn off all the flow and add them at nighttime. And then just leave your flow off for half an hour or so. That way they have, you know, I usually dump half in the display and half in the refugium. Gives them time to get in the rock works in there. Um, don't do it when the lights are on or else you'll just see your fish have a feeding frenzy and there goes half your pods. Turn Go your skimmer off and uh, take your filter socks out too because they can, mm -hmm. they'll get filtered out by that. But they'll settle really quick. So an hour or so, they'll settle down in the substrate. Um, and even like the, the larval or the ones that are swimming around, they'll just kind of hover down around substrate. They'll be protected they'll, because they're not, they're not strong enough to swim in any kind of flow or anything. Um, they'll get pushed to where they, you know, are, are out of flow and where they're going to settle. Like, you know, Devin said mm -hmm. down the fuge or in your rocks past that hour, man, uh, they're going to do what they're going to do. And they're, yeah. they're like, they reproduce, man. Like, I mean, I'm sure you guys have experienced this. They just appear out of nowhere. Like they mm -hmm. literally reproduce. Just like all the other things that grow on our fish, Asterina starfish, you know, spaghetti worms, um, you know, all these things that just kind of seem to appear out of nowhere. Copepods are the same way. Like, I've had yeah. copepods in my tank since as long as I can remember before you could even buy a live copepod in a bottle. Um, mm -hmm. I think the first ones I saw were, like, the Reef Nutrition, and they were actually selling, like, dead ones at first. Um, and then, it, you know, like, as a food, <laughs> you know, like the stuff okay, that fair. NIO sells, like the, the yeah. like, liquid foods. Um mm -hmm. And then, you know, all of a sudden they have these new ones um, or these, these live ones. And I mean, that was a long, long time ago. But I remember when they first came out asking myself, I saw that fridge in the store, man, like the Reef Nutrition's fridge. And I'm just like, why would you need like they just kind of grow by themselves. But then there's the truth with like different species and, um, you know, just providing a, a, a different biodiversity for the mm -hmm. tank, which is nice. And now, like nowadays, too, we're starting with uh, much more sterile tanks, you know, your dry yeah. rock, your dry sand. Yeah. So there's probably tanks out there that um, they have to be introduced, sure. whether it's on a frag plug or whatever. There, there's yeah. some way they get introduced. And, and, and there's a lot of truth in that. And I've only built two tanks with dry rock. No, three tanks, three tanks, mm -hmm. with dry, like dry two dry rock. Um, it's only yeah. been three tanks now. I've um, and I've built. So outside of work, I've built five. And so mm -hmm. the first, yeah, the first two were live rock tanks. And then the th last three were dry rock tanks yeah. outside of work. Those are like personal tanks. Yep. Nice. So 
I guess the one aspect is a you want to build up your colony sooner, or b like you said, is diversity, right? You're adding ones you know are good and you want in the tank, and that's a good reason to do it. And then hopefully the good guys outnumber whatever other random ones are in there. Yeah, I talked to Algie Burn about this, and I think mm-hmm. eventually you one will dominate. Like you'll always, I think you'll always have sort of like the, you know, sort of a biodiversity, but you know it's nutrient limited. Uh, only so many can survive, and then usually you have one that dominates, and it's kind of hard to tell which one that'll be. Um, mm-hmm. So when you buy those mixed bottles where it's multiple species, like it's good and it's great, you're, you're adding biodiversity. But I think at the end of the day, what's going to happen is your tank will dominate a particular isopod or amphipod yeah. um, or copepod, mm-hmm. and that's I mean that's just the way it'll be. A similar thing for culturing pods too. I know like if you mix them together, yeah, you know one's going to win, right? Like tear yeah. pods are going to need the apex pods because they're much bigger and type of thing. Right. So, considerations. Uh, so now that we've talked pods to death. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you didn't know you needed to know about pods. Yeah. So we talked about, oh gosh, what we talked about. Uh, we talked about frags, talked about test kits. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Additives? Do we, do we have anything to say about additives? I guess we touched on that quite a bit, didn't we? Is there anything that you regularly dose on a continuous basis to your systems? So I've got, uh, for calcium and alkalinity, I've got a uh, BRS two-part. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the only thing that I'm actually dosing right now. So I mentioned earlier that I'm doing weekly water changes. So it's about 20 gallons a week on a 75, uh, maybe 80 gallons of total mm-hmm. water volume once you account for the sump and you know minus rock and sand and all that good stuff. Nice. Um so I, I'm not dosing any trace elements or uh, aminos uh, or anything I have in the past. Mm-hmm. Probably should revisit the trace element thing now that the tank is, you know, a little over two years old and the yep. corals are getting nice and big. They are. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, just the just the BRS two part right now. Nice. Now, twenty percent weekly is a decent sized water change, so you're probably getting a lot of it from that. Yeah, and. Um, I, I kind of did that on purpose because there's really not much filtration in the tank other mm-hmm. than uh, uh, undersized skimmer. Um, obviously, you've got your biological filtration, too, and things like that. I've, I've got a, a section in the sump that's you know ready to go for a fuge. I've got a, a light and everything, but every time I test phosphates and you know on the brief occasion that I, I do test nitrates, they're just not high enough for me to justify you know introducing macroalgae so that chamber mm-hmm. just kind of sits empty and mm-hmm. you know probably part of it is due to the larger weekly water changes but yep. i don't mind doing it it gives me some time to look over the tank and um you know really look at the corals and identify issues before you know they're larger issues that are irreversible mm-hmm it, it gives you a really solid buffer to doing those decent water changes. That way there's not really as much of a risk of anything building up over time because it's so diluted. So Yeah, obviously not super realistic for larger systems, but mm-hmm. I would say like if you have the time and mm-hmm. you have a system less than 100 gallons, it's you know it might be worth it to do a, a weekly larger water change. Yeah. I, I've become a fan of the automated ones, so actually... So excited. <laughs> I know, I know. I have to remember to clean the sand every once in a while because my little tiny <laughs> Get away daily water changes. Yeah. I, no, I actually, I actually did it like a week ago for the first time in like probably four or five months now, but every once in a while you got to do it. So that's all you put in your tank, Adam? Just two part? What about aminos and stuff like that, like food? No? Just no. feeding the... I'm trying to think. Um, so I've got... As far as food goes, um, so I've got uh, seaweed extreme pellets uh, on an auto feeder to go off twice a day uh, for my two tangs. Um, Nori sheets, usually every day. Sometimes I miss a day here and there. Um, I'm doing LRS, um, Reef Frenzy, Herbivore Mm -hmm. Frenzy. Uh, That's really it. I'm trying to think. Like I said, I've done... um, uh, acro power in the past yeah i probably did that for about two months um mm-hmm. and then i had a dino issue and hmm. stopped doing that just to try to curb the dinos and never really restarted but mm-hmm. did you yeah. notice a difference from dosing aminos for two months yes so 
Um, I've only I've only got a couple of before and after pictures uh, because at the time uh, VRS was doing a lot with the Brightwell Coral Amino, mm -hmm. um, and I just happened to have Acro Power, so I was using that. Um, but yeah, like all the before and after pictures I was seeing out of the Coral Amino, uh, you know, I don't want to call it a study, but uh, like community trial, mm -hmm. were pretty compelling. So that's when I started taking before and after pictures, and you know, because you look at your tank every day, and it's hard to hard to say like yeah, this one thing that I did caused this, you know, change or how big is this change really? So, um, yeah, I would say mostly in the acros, I didn't notice any difference in the LPS, but mm -hmm. definitely in the SPS corals. Okay. Nice. How about you, Robert? Did you find much of a difference with aminos versus no aminos? Yeah, so I've been dosing aminos for a long time. I think ever since Acro Power came out is kind of mm -hmm. when I first got into them, and then now I'm just always using them. Um, I'll use coral amino, like, in mix it in with my foods. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes <laughs> if, uh, like, I'll do a direct dose as well with something like Acro Power or um, the Brightwell. They have another amino that's a more of a general additive for the tank. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, most definitely do that. Uh, I'm kind of an ESV two-part guy um, if I'm not running a calcium reactor um, yep. and then doing, you know, direct adjustments if I need to. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, ESV has kind of always been a good one for me. I've tried others and never had the same amount of luck I've had with ESV. I don't know why. I attribute it to trace elements. Um, I have never run a tank on BRS two-part, so that's going to be an exciting thing. <laughs> that will be <laughs> a fun have to thing. Try it. Uh, yeah, I know when I got this tank. I'm getting real close to this tank to have water, man. I'm excited. Um, so that'll be fun. Uh, I'll probably do that on the first, uh, right out of the gate on this new tank. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, I'm going to run like an LPS softy uh, macroalgae type tank. So I'm just not going to have a huge demand. Um, yep. So it might be a little bit easier to run, you know, like a, a the BRS two part. And then just do a manual. I'm always doing a general trace element additive. Uh, so I use, I've used the Brightwell replenish for a long, 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 long time. And it's always, mm -hmm. um, it's always kept my ICPs on track, or at least I, I credit it to keeping the ICPs and never getting me in the red zone for any of those minor elements. Nice. Um, the ESV has, tr uh, s yeah, I guess the minor elements in with, uh, the calcium and out components. Yep. So that keeps like, um. I forget some of them. I want to say strontium and boron, like some of those other ones that you, you often find in two parts. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I attribute the, the ESV to keeping those ICPs on track. Um, I think that's it. Nice. Yeah, trace, right. two part, aminos. Oh, and then I do I feed frozen food like a crazy man, because um, feeding is so much fun. It's like it's the one time you interact with your fish tank that's not work. Um, it, yeah. And there there it's is so actually nice. a lot of aminos in like something like mysis too, right? So yes. you so, indirectly get a bunch that way. Right, and so. I, I do a concoction of food most often. Um, mm -hmm. I find myself adding pellets or whatever food I have. Um, let's be honest, I have a ton of different fish foods at all times. Um, and so I'll just randomly mix them together. I do mm -hmm. make it a point to feed a nori, like Adam said, um, or I'll, I'll, like every other time I'll buy the, um, I use Rod's food and I'll buy the herbivore blend because it's just always been readily available to me. Um, so every other time I'll buy like the herbivore blend just to make sure that they're getting that. But I mean, with foods like rods or LRS, man, like the fish just gobble it up. Like mm -hmm. it's, you know, it doesn't matter. Like my starry bunny yep. and my tangs are eating right next to, um, you know, your omnivorous and carniv carnivorous fish. So, um, and I think that's just the, the result of just being a high quality, you know, mm -hmm. diet like that's frozen. Yeah. Stuff. And, and if you don't have access to that sort of thing, um, like Celcon is a great additive. Oh, there's uh, a good one. I've used Celcon. I, I want to say, uh, what is it? KZ has their uh, amino acids uh, for fish that you will oh, right. you know, add directly to your food. Yeah. So, you know, you've mm -hmm. always got options like that if you're just, you know, using the the straight up mysis. Yep. You know, uh, trace elements. So the last, so when I ran, uh, I ran a, a large red sea tank for a long time and I used uh, the KZ coral system and that worked mm -hmm. pretty good. I used that for. Uh, trace on that that last I want to say 12 yeah 12 to 18 months of that tank and it, it did pretty well nice <clears throat> my current trace elements is the coral booster just because you're talking about KZ is in my head yeah sure I'm, I'm still on the fence on how much this does but I've been dosing it for a few months now I just got another <laughs> bottle of it so we'll see over yeah time. I know we talked about this a little bit I know uh uh, so much mystery before. around it's, <laughs> it's freaking expensive though so i'm only dosing 50 percent of what it recommends it's like okay sure. dose like eight mils a day i'm like you can have four mils so I'm <laughs> you're only getting four <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so I do a half dose of that. And then there's the Brightwell Trace Elements that has like a whole slew of stuff mixed in. I dose that randomly. And then there's the iodine and the Chato Grow and I potassium. I remember in the in the very beginning, people, you know, would talk about Lugol's and iodine solution and how beneficial it was. And then I talked to a, a chemist one day and um, she's like, it's impossible to test for iodine for one. Like even in the lab, we have a hard time testing for it. And then, you know, you read, uh, you know, from some of these, uh, these pioneer guys and they talk about iodine getting consumed so quickly, you couldn't add enough to, to have it in your, t- like it gets consumed overnight. Um, so that leads me to believe that iodine would be very beneficial because I'm sure there's some, you know, process or so, there's some way that these corals benefit from it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I've, I've thought about it for a long time and I've just, you know, I've dosed it at random. I've never sat down or like made in a point to say, like, okay, was there a distinct change? And like, like you said, try to document it, you know, it's just kind of been random when I put it in, but I've mm-hmm. always had that knowledge in my head of like, well, it, it gets consumed so quickly. Um, and then, you know, you talk about like the link between, a Xenia and some of these these soft mm-hmm. corals and, the, and you know you you see documentation where it's like oh dose dose iodine and that's you know that's what's going to get these corals uh, to grow faster and get bigger and fluffier so um, that is an interesting one I, I definitely I think there's more room for research on that end of things the the biggest thing for me like I don't really test them very often so I actually just ordered a nice pee test or two to see how I'm doing with my random when I think of it dosing is going but I I, I it's better to overdosing certain ones can be bad like in the past i've overdosed red sea trace elements and certain colors just took over right like you know my rainbow monty just was all orange like there's there's certain ones that would take over if in excess that whatever mineral does that color Hmm. so i kind of do a half dose a lot of them like i'm probably supposed to do like you know four cap full like 20 mils i'm like "Eh, you can have 10 so i just like randomly half dosing so i know i'm not limiting myself but i'm have a goal of trying to let you know get a dialed in on a doser and try and find that kind of sweet spot and keep everything in the it's important to clarify that is trace elements yeah not major elements major elements need to be kept to a t Um, and and the reason being is because (laughs) these trace elements aren't going to cause a major swing in ph temp salinity calcium Mm -hmm. or alk um which you know the major elements definitely affect those other parameters um but the point there is you can't you get you know those swings will stress coral out and when you have st- swings in pH, alkalinity, calcium, um, you know that's when you cause some stress. So it's important to keep yeah. those things on point. Um, and when we talk about random dosing, it's things like trace, trace elements, yeah. iodine, aminos, things that, for one, they're not easily testable, and two, they're in the water in such minor amounts that you're not causing a major change in chemistry. You can yeah. generally get away without dosing them, but I find when you do, you seem to get better coloration or like the corals seem a bit more vibrant and happier. Like it, it's hard to explain it, but it just seems to look better. And I think there's a big correlation on, uh, you know, trace elements and in the age of the tank. So like mm-hmm. I fill a tank with brand new salt water, you know, in theory, my trace elements are at a hundred percent, you know, Maybe after that first year, I'm at 80%. And then after the second year, I'm at, you know, 50%. And it's just kind of this downward spiral. And I think it's it's probably part of the reason why people, you know, struggle to keep a tank past that, you know, one or two year mark. It's probably not the only factor, but it's definitely, you know, one of the factors. It's always a combo of things for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. L- Long term. Yeah, so new tank, not an issue. A year or two in, might be worth starting to pay attention to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. All right, so additives. Um, ATO, what kind of ATO you use? ATO, I have the Neptune one on one tank, and I have the Auto Aqua one on the other tank. What do you Which use? one do you like better? They both work well. They both have worked well for you. <laughs> I'm a tons of Osmolator guy. It's the best. Yep. It really is, man. I've used most all of them mm-hmm. um i've failed with most all of them i've even had a tonsy fail on me but it definitely is the most reliable one um i like how it comes with the pump uh it's pretty straightforward you know uh the, t- the internal timer is nice because you can adjust it per tank size um mm-hmm. and have a pretty consistent fill with minimal risk of overfill or underfill so um yeah i pretty much if i'm buying an auto top off that's gonna be the one i buy every time and i've even used their nano oscillator uh with great luck you know i used to have that one float. yeah mm-hmm. and i just make sure it's got the little cover that comes with it so it keeps most everything off the float and 
works mm-hmm. works just as well. Yeah, yeah oscillator for me as well, except for this little tank uh, hand topping it off for now until I get annoyed with doing that, and then I'll probably pick yeah. up an oscillator for it. I How will long do you say... think it'll last? Oh, man, this I, I want to say this tank's been up for two or three months now. Uh, mm-hmm. It's hard because in the wintertime when the air's so dry, like I can maybe go away for a three-day weekend before it starts to spit bubbles. So, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. hopefully but once you know, all this COVID you know stuff's funny. over, I'll be, it's you know, funny. taking longer vacations and then i'll need an oscillator for it for sure Mm -hmm. no definitely it's yeah if you're not home you could do like the super ghetto one and use like the upside down pop bottle on the tank (laughs) the one thing that i like so talking about atos um Mm -hmm. you have like the xp aqua i think they call it the duetto you've got that uh micro ato um auto aqua made for a long time and i love that because it's optical sensor and now they've got them where there's two sensors in the one thing but the damn magnets are so weak i mean that's the downside to these little sensors Mm. man um you can bump those magnets so easily and so i just you know i think that's why tunzi wins on this is because they have a strong magnet and you don't you can't bump it out of the way they're both using optical sensors um it's pretty straightforward they're using a you know a programmable Mm -hmm. board or whatever like operates the same technology uh And so that's something I definitely wish to see is some of these others that are taking advantage of optical sensor Mm -hmm. is is definitely give us a more robust magnet that isn't so easily bumped. Because you can bump it with your leg when you're walking away from your tank and empty the five gallons or not fill the next day and just put that baby on the back half of the sump where you can't reach it or, or touch it well okay <laughs> yep. so now you're pulling something out of the sump and you bump it you're turning your skimmer to you know to clean that and you bump it you need I mean, wear management your my chamber. friend <laughs> your pump chamber and you gotta you know maintenance your pump or something i've just i've done it multiple times so maybe i'm scared right. of it. I, um, I do agree that the the uh tunes magnets are they're good. by far the best yeah. Uh, out of all the auto top offs that are available, like they're the strongest, at least of any of the ones that I'm aware of. Mm-hmm. I would agree. Um, not directly auto top off, well, kind of is. One thing I actually stole that, got the idea from Thomas one of his videos, but um, the marriage saver one with the optical that shuts off the water when mm, it hits the sensor, the flood guardian, yeah, yeah. Fl- yeah, the flood guardian. I put that on my frag tank in my auto top off bin. And then I hooked it up to the RODI unit, but then I put that on a timer. So every four days it kicks it on for like five hours. So it just refills my ATO for me and yeah. I never have to do oh, it. It's brilliant. Love yeah, it. no, that's a, that's a great use for that one. Um, and you don't get this, you don't get the CDS creep either because you're not yeah. constantly up and down. That's a, that was a brilliant device for as simple as it is, uh, mm-hmm. having it stand alone like that made it very accessible because prior you had to have like a controller or something, something to control those solenoids. Um, and now having it by itself is, is super nice, um, essentially and, to the optical sensor attached yeah. to a solenoid. Exactly. S- simple timer, too. I mean, you could just completely automate refilling your bins, and there's yeah. a float valve on there just in case that ever fails. So you got your multiple levels of redundancy, and, you know, if you only let it run for five hours every four or five days, then, again, there's, like, so many levels of redundancy put in. I don't know. That's yeah. a sweet way to go. I was, I was very surprised it took us that long to come out with that device. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, how about filter media? You guys, uh, what kind of filter media you guys use? Let's go mechanical and chemical. Filter roller for life. Can't go back. Yep. Socks. <laughs> Socks is all. Socks. That's all I got. <laughs> How often do you change them? Uh, so I've got a collection of uh, eight inch and uh, fourteen inch, I think, socks. So mm-hmm. fourteen inch socks usually uh, will go for maybe five days. The yep. eight inch socks will be maybe three. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be honest, I don't really use them for, like, nutrient control. Uh, it's more just, like, polishing up the water, removing any of the bigger particles. So yep. I don't really care if they overflow or if they're not doing, you know, the mm-hmm. nutrient export job. So That's I just them in there until they start to get to be overflowing, which is probably not the, the best uh, way to do it. But it's it, it achieves the goal that I put them in there for. Yeah. Solid. Um, so I used filter roller in the last tank that I had, which is now mm-hmm. almost two years ago. But, um, yeah, man, I think filter roller, I'll never look back. It was just so nice. Um, so easy. I mean, it was so effective, too, with both nutrient and water polishing. Um, it's going to be hard to convince me to use the sock again until I get one that I can't, like, you know, it screws up on me or something and gets stinky. But I, I haven't had that experience yet, you know. Um, a lot of people have some trouble with that. I think there's room for that manual turning one, which does exist somewhere. I just can't remember which company makes it. Sure. Um, 
but yeah, Cla- I think it- the the Clara C people had a, a manual version, yeah. which to me makes no sense. I'm like, because well, it wasn't I like, like it- super cheap. Like you might as well spend the extra little bit and automate it rather than having to. Yeah, you know. no, I think I would choose to do an automated one because yeah, mm-hmm. that's the whole goal. But at the same time, um, I still find it much more convenient and more effective than a filter sock because. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just rolling it, and it's 100% of that water is going through a finer mesh. Um, and so I, I think it's still more effective either way. Yeah. Um, yeah I w- oh, go ahead. I was going to say on the filter stock topic, um, I just I love that it's reusable. So, like, I'm not mm-hmm. throwing away all of this uh, material. Um, I, I want to say it was, like, Black Friday 2019. Uh, BRS was doing like a, a, a best tips or something. So there was some sort of contest going on mm-hmm. and someone suggested a, a, a miniature washing machine specifically for your filter socks. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're like 150 bucks that so you can get them mm-hmm. on uh, yeah. uh, from Walmart or whatever. And you know, if you've got a hey, spouse man. that's not cool with you washing your filter socks in the washing machine, like, man, that's the way to go. Yeah, that, that um, is a good idea. That's like the mini fridge for your frozen foods. You, yeah. you guys remember that guy that made the like he put a, a dosing pump on top of the mini fridge and you know yeah. had it auto dosing from that. We well, can buy those little little like six pack of Coke to little tiny fridges for like fifty bucks. And, oh, that's right. They drill, have like the mini mini the ones now. Oh, yeah. I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. That's um, a good way to go. So chemical media. I don't use anything like that personally. No GFO or carbon unless I absolutely have to. What about you, uh, Devin? I use GFO. So my phosphates don't get crazy. Like consistently? All the time? Uh, I change it every probably two months. And then I'm actually testing out some other nitrate removal media stuff right now. Like a so, resin? Yeah, it's some kind of like weird little spongy looking cubes. Mm. I think it's some form of carbon dosing. It's supposed to be really effective at that. So I'm overdue to test my nitrates and see how it's working. But huh. hopefully it works well because my so nutrients for a way Specifically, too high. carbon and GFO. I don't use mm-hmm. any GFO in really unless I'm in a pickle and I want to bring it down, but then I'll pull it off after I get down. Um, mm-hmm. I just, I really try to, to build a filtration system and a maintenance routine that can maintain that without mm-hmm. having to maintain media because I hate maintaining media reactors. That is the worst job ever. <laughs> yeah. Spill them. <laughs> I, I do. I agree with that. I've got a BRS mini reactor on standby just in case. Uh, I, you know, much like my fish meds, um, I consider carbon to kind of be that, you know, emergency kit necessity. Mm -hmm. Um, you never know what's going to happen and carbon. So useful in a wide variety of different situations. So I think it's wise to have it on the shelf, even if you're not using it regularly. Do you use it in your tank though or only in an emergency or do you every well, couple of months you just run some for the heck of it no i so for the first six months or so of this tank i i did run carbon 24 mm-hmm. 7 um but yeah i don't it's it's one of those things like i could probably do the bucket test and and visually see like oh yeah my water is not as yellow as it used to be but mm-hmm. yeah it's just not something that i've ever run continuously other than the first six months of the tank and and, um, you know, it's just one more thing to maintain. And if I'm getting the results I'm looking for without it, you know, I'm, I'm all for keeping it simple. There you yeah, go, man. That's, that's the true. key is if, as long as you're getting the results you want, that makes you happy. Have uh, you ever used UV or ozone? So, uh, this frag tank has one of the, so this is a Nuvo 20, nothing yep. too crazy. Um, I've got one of the, um, aqua gadget little dropping uh, ones in the yeah i think it's like nine watts i mm-hmm. was seeing some dinos on the the frag rack i mean there's like one piece of rock that i had in uh my other tank that i kind of seeded this tank with um so yeah it seemed to work well uh, all the dinos went away um i never really looked at them under a microscope i just kind of threw it in there and figured if it works it works if, if it doesn't it mm-hmm. doesn't like there's no harm in trying it yep. um but yeah, um, I'm so I'm, I've got a, a tank sitting on the floor behind me that mm-hmm. I'm gonna redo my office and set that one up and move everything from the current 75 into this one. Nice. Um, I think I'm gonna try to incorporate a UV sterilizer. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how I'm gonna do it yet because you know obviously I'm gonna try to keep up everything under the tank and it's you know just one more thing to have to cram in there. But I, I do see enough benefit to justify the sterilizer for sure. Yep. 
it um I took my ozone off when I swapped to UV, and so far it's been doing an awesome job of just like the crystal clear water. Um, the jury is still out on like the clean the glass aspect, if there's much of a difference or not. But it definitely does give you that nice crystal clear water, which is always my main benefit of it, especially like a big long peninsula, just that long end, just be able to see crystal clear the ends a big benefit. Yeah, I think I think if I'm going to set it up, you know, obviously there's different flow rates for you know the different things that you're trying to do with the UV sterilizer. I think mm-hmm. I'm going to set it up more for like fish parasites, which, you know, will will probably still help clear up the water too, uh, mm-hmm. to a certain extent. Um, I've, the fish that are in my tank, like the oldest one I've had for like six years, and most of them are three or four years old in in my care. So, mm-hmm. just you know, at this point they're pets, so I just yeah. want to make sure that they're they're taken care of. And, Keep them around, yeah. Yeah, exactly. For sure. No, I wouldn't hesitate. Oh. I think. Uh, Actually, Ryan, like some of the stuff Ryan's doing has is, is, has turned me around on UVs. Uh, I've used them on ponds. I've used them on freshwater tanks. Uh, I put one on a saltwater tank, mm-hmm. uh, just to say that I did it, and to you know, really just to learn how to install the UV sterilizer, because yeah. um, you know it's my job. Um, and yeah, so beyond that, I think it's not only these until these last couple years that I'm like really coming around to seeing a benefit um, of really building your tank, like building it into your system and having it you know permanent i mean we're seeing more and more tanks with two of them uh to run both flow rates you know mm-hmm. i think if i was doing a, a big build and you know budget was there for it i would at least run one and yeah like adam said i'd probably choose to do it for parasites because mm-hmm. i th- i think i've got a pretty good grasp on algae control and stuff and i understand mm-hmm. that um so i think i would i would definitely choose to run one with uh yeah for parasites with slower flow in other words yeah so. I, I shamelessly have not tested my flow and have no idea what's going through right now, but the water is crystal clear and that's my main goal. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that if, uh, if I do end up going the UV route, which I'm, I'm probably like 60% chance right now, yeah. um, if I do go that route, I'm going to do the, uh, the flow monitoring kit with, yeah. uh, Neptune because mm-hmm. for me, it's, it's one of those things. If I'm going to take all the time to figure out how to incorporate this into my system, yeah, and you might as well plumb it in <laughs> yeah. and mount it up and, uh, you know, pay for the sterilizer. I want it mm-hmm. to work exactly how I think it's going to work. Um, yeah. and you know, that's just part of it. Plus I'm going to plumb it in through my return, uh, just so that it's, it's, you know, all of the water is going through the UV. Yeah. So having a pulse on my return mm-hmm. pump, flow rate is going to be good too just for mm. you know redundancy sake just in case something happens yep that's a solid reason nice excellent um we, we talked about food we talked we about did. fragging yep. how about right, temp so, control oh you go ahead adam uh stocking stuffers just going back to that topic yep. so oh, sure. uh in, in tools of the trade too two things that uh i wanted to talk about uh one this is gonna sound stupid but one thing that i love to have around for uh, packing DI resin, mm-hmm. canning funnel, super a canning super. funnel. Hmm. Yeah, so it, this is like fits perfectly inside of the refillable cartridge. So where do you find this things. wonderful funnel? Uh, I think I just got this at Walmart or something like that. Okay, but it's got like a super wide mouth, so you're not mm-hmm. spilling those oh, annoying yeah. DI beads everywhere like I used to all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's that's a must-have. Um, and then something I still need to install, uh, but the neat aquatics uh, hmm. portals are yeah, it's a brilliant one, man. Freaking awesome! <laughs> yeah, no, it's a definitely a brilliant one. Um, yeah, especially since so many people are understanding the value of a screen top now, and it's um, only twenty bucks. Yeah. It's cheap. Yeah, yeah, they are super cheap. They're super easy because you can do the cutouts, and you know you can accommodate hang-on gear. You mm-hmm. can accommodate all-in-one tanks. You can set them down inside a rimless tank and hardly notice they're there. Yep. Got different size meshes. It's come a long way since having to yeah. use a glass and, top acrylically. And if yeah. you're going to go through the trouble of of building a screen top, like you can install these on an existing screen top. But if you're going to go through the trouble of building a new screen top, uh, we've got black. Uh, I think it's quarter inch nice. uh, mesh. And I, I just built a new screen top for my tank at the Beer House office, and it looks so awesome with like, you know, the the black. Uh, uh, frame the black netting the black portal like mm-hmm. it and there's just less glare coming from the tank and coming from the um, yeah. coming from the yeah. netting with that clear stuff it might block a little bit more light but it's worth it yeah it's it's totally worth it right yeah 
100% do the black. It for, for me, the clear just reflects light back at you, and it's like, boom, yep. here's a top, right? Where the black, it just blends in. You don't even really notice you have a top. Yeah. Especially if you've got a black rim tank. Mm-hmm. Like, it looks so sleek. Oh, because, mm-hmm. yeah, it's hidden behind the it black area. Yep. yep, so I, I think it's a really good way to go. How um, about you, Devin? What are some, some great tools of the trade, man? Something that's, like, unique, something that you always have. Like, you're, it's going to be in every single tank that you have, and it's not a magnet cleaner. <laughs> we, we all we all need magnet cleaners. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Stocking stuffer. I love this thing. I use it all the time. Yeah. Um, if you don't have one, or if you're using the good old floaty bobber or even refractive meters, I mean, you bump them, you knock it out to calibration. I'm a big fan of these, and they'd be a great little stocking stuffer. What else would be a secondary one? I'm staring at my supply shelf of what I use a lot. I don't know. So the, fl- no, Flipper, okay, I know you said no magnet cleaners, yeah, but Flipper awesome. did just come out with their floating version. Oh, and there you go. I think that is pretty sweet. I mean, a magnet cleaner <laughs> is a great stocking stuffer for any reefer. Mm-hmm. I just <laughs> yeah, was was challenging Devin to come up with something that not yeah. everybody uses. Um, I am a fan of the Flipper as well. Um, just I, I know the whole point of it is to flip. I don't flip. No, I the, just the use the razor parts. blade only. Yep. I think the flip part's a bit of a myth. It works. It just is very difficult to do every time. But now that they float, man, that's freaking. Mm-hmm. They solved every issue I have with the flipper. So oh, that's good. Well. That's good. Uh, I um, the nano one I find a little on the weak side. The medium and the max ones I think are awesome. Yeah. So much that I have two of them on my peninsula. So I have one on either side of the tank. So whatever side oh, I walk on, I'm like, oh, I'll clean. Yeah, Let's yeah. go. That's yeah. the thing. Um, and that's yeah. a great, a great p- bit of advice is clean. You know, magnet clean your tank every day. It's so it's easy. And if you do it every day. You, we won't grow the stuff that's hard to to get off the the mm-hmm. bright green crystalline algae, coralline algae. You know the stuff that you actually have to use the blade or get in with a razor blade or a scraper. If you do mm-hmm. it every day, that stuff will not grow, and you're never gonna have to spend eight hours scrubbing you know four walls of your tank. Yeah. Except with well, the back wall, it will happen, but that just happens. Uh, <laughs> you can't get around the back wall sometimes. So um, <clears throat> two for you, Robert. What do you got? Uh, okay. <laughs> That we haven't said already. So I, I talked about my beakers. <laughs> my beakers yep. are fun ones. Um, forceps, mm. man. Long tongs. Long curved blade tongs. That's a good one for you, Devin, is the magnetic mm-hmm. Uh But, you know, I don't... Nah, I don't have any with me right here. I'm very sorry. But long curved tipped tongs mm-hmm. are, like, the best thing. You know, we talked about putting our, our hands in the water. Um, but I love these things. You get bristle worms with them. You can get frags that drop with them. Um, you know, it saves yourself from, like I said, cutting yourself or, or picking different things up in the tank, uh, feeding with them, you know, you hand feed with them. Uh, so those are great little bits, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that I, I have under every single tank. I usually have four or five pairs of them, um, <laughs> just because I'm careless with them and I'll let them rust and stuff. And so I'll toss them out and just get new ones. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, those are definitely ones that I like to have yes. specimen containers. So like the little plastic, you know, with, with the hang on lip. Uh, they're super great because you can hang them on the lip of your tank when you're working. You can put things in there, um, such as the tongs, the credit card, uh, mm-hmm. you know, any additive you're using, uh, frag glue. It helps to have a little spot for that. Um, but then also if you're in a pinch and you need an isolation tank or something, drill a couple holes inside of it, and now you've got an isolation tank. And you, you could keep, you know, an aggressive fish or, uh, you know, some inverts or something in there. Um, so I always keep those, just the classic, like, Lee's ones mm-hmm. with the little, you know, hook on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about, you know, having a second thermometer, which is like the calibration thermometer. Um, Adam, why don't you talk real quick about those floating hydrometers? Remember the, the ones that actually that float? Versus yeah. Um, like a, not a swing float, the, the glass bearing. one. Yeah. The that has bearing. been out of stock for two months. I've legitimately been trying to buy yeah. one. And every time I look, I'm like, every time I do an order, I'm like, oh, still yeah. out of stock. So they're awesome. <laughs> Adam, tell us why they're awesome. Yeah. So, I mean... Just from an accuracy standpoint, there, I, I would probably trust that more than just about any other salinity measuring device. Mm-hmm. So, it's it's hard to really describe without without showing a picture of them because if you look at at the small glass tube that mm-hmm. that's sticking up out of the water when you're using it, like there are so many lines and and it's it's crazy how much difference like. If, if it's floating this much, it's, you know, uh, 1.026. If it's floating this much, it's 1.0262. You know, like it, okay. it, the the level of precision is just, is just crazy. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Um, and the only downside is no flow, you know. 
you get you got to have turn your flow off or have like well and i would actually i would actually fill up a container and then okay. take it out like, of like a tall beaker graduate like a tall cylinder. beaker yeah yeah <laughs> exactly and yeah. i would do it i would do it separate from the tank for sure so it, it right. does take way more time to measure salinity than just right. about any other device but then again it's probably one of the more accurate ways to go and it, just for double checking or something's off or you don't want to calibrate yours, you know, it's like the best double check because you know it's always going to be perfectly accurate. And Ro yeah. Robert's big tall beakers fill out the water, pop that baby in, and it's like perfect. Yeah. And you can... Yeah. And it's like a, the thermometer. Like you're you're going to calibrate your probes uh, based on the, you know, certified thermometer. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would trust this um, to determine whether or not my uh, Hannah salinity checker is reading accurately or my Milwaukee is reading accurately. Yeah, this is it's, a big one too. Yeah. We get a lot of frustrated people that, and it's kind of like an, an answerless question. Which one do I trust? And it's like, well, I don't know which one's more accurate. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> well, and honestly, like it's a, it's a, um, there is some facts to them and like, you know, okay, you know, check them with a reference solution. Um, well, did you calibrate your pH probe? Did you check it? You know, is mm -hmm. it two years old? Whatever. Like there's definitely some, some troubleshooting there. Um, but For at sure. the end of the day, like, you know, like, yeah, it's very difficult sometimes to really get back on track once you're off track and you, and you don't trust any of them. You know, you've got one reading high, you've got one reading low, you know, maybe your solution's off. Um, and you know, you can't reference either of them. Uh, and so this is a great tool to just kind of to get you back on track and get, you know, hone in the skill and understand, um, that, you know, it's really not all that scary and you can be pretty accurate as long as you're, you know, you have the right tools for the job. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I'm just looking at the chat as we're, uh, <laughs> we're going here. Are either yeah. of you guys use webcams for your tank? No, I, oh, I, I keep thinking about one. it. Adam, you just bought one. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah, which one? Well, for the computer. Yeah. Uh, okay. those, uh, what are they? Ways? Wise, I Wise. Yeah. Uh, those cameras seem to be pretty popular in the hobby. It would be a great, great mm -hmm. stocking stuffer. Yeah, I've been. It'd be awesome to have like a super stealthy one that you could like have underwater, so you don't get all like the reflections or other stuff in it. Yeah, they had. They but made it's one. Be sleek. There was yeah. one. It, it leaked though. Was the problem? Yeah. Oh, That's really? Good. Well, because you uh, know, I think about the salt water being, you know, no, uh, you're right, you're right, a, a mm -hmm. corrosive thing. You know, it's it's going to try to get into whatever seal is in the camera. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, I have used them and pointed them at my tank. Um, I've used Wi-Fi cams going on vacation. It's definitely nice for peace of mind, man. I, you mm. know, I would probably, <laughs> I would like to have that. I mean, definitely have an Apex for alerts and controls and everything. But man, I would love to have that Wi-Fi cam over a lot of things because really, yes, I'm, I'm worried about pH. And I'm worried about tanking temp and salinity. Um, but man, like it's the flood that really scares the shit out of me. <laughs> You know, like, cool. I mean, that's it, you know, like, like if Did power I... goes off or like some cracks or, you know, I don't know, just, um, you know, a fitting blows off. Like, that's the thing that I would hate to happen when I'm gone, you know. Did I ever tell you about my one buddies? Okay. This is when um, we were like, because we got married in Mexico on the beach and my one buddy that came, he's also a reefer. And so he put um, like a 50 gallon brood or whatever beside his sump with his ATO in it, but he didn't consider oh, a siphon break. He did tell me this. He so our other reefer friend was tank sitting for him. He came over, sent us a photo. It was honestly within a millimeter of the top of his sump. He he's so lucky it leveled out where it did. Like you could like blow on it and probably would have spilled out. It didn't spill a drop, but it was like within a millimeter. It was like That's crazy where level. So it leveled it basically drained like half of the tote because it yeah. leveled out with the sump yeah. like and then it stopped. Oh, that's yeah. funny. <laughs> With, yeah, within luckily, a millimeter or two. It's crazy. Luckily, uh, we went to Jamaica a couple of years ago mm -hmm. uh, for like, it was like 10 days. It was like the longest I've ever been away from the tank with with yeah. no tank sitter. And uh, so I had a 20 gallon brute next to the tank. And I we were like, it was like the night before. I'm like getting all this stuff set up. And they're like, you know, plug in the, the oscillator and get everything going. And then it keeps going. I'm like, oh, the siphon. So I was like, undo all of my tubing and then like mm -hmm. have the oscillator go to the to the display instead of the sump and it was just like this big pain in the butt but i'm so glad i tested it <laughs> yeah oh yeah if it's easy to forget about that darn siphon man it is yeah. yep ah <clears throat> uh, good one well now, boys well so stocking stuffers you know what else makes good stocking stuffers gift cards <laughs> brs gift cards that's right yes or they you do can go to ask brs tv and leave a comment 
for your chance to win a ten dollar gift card every day now through the end of the you know, every single day yes yeah. so just just that yeah. shameless plug uh yep. so ask for your stv facebook <laughs> yep. group um pinned in the announcement posts uh mm -hmm. every day uh starting yesterday through christmas eve we're going to give away uh 10 10 dollar gift codes nice. to uh, random reefers so go to the facebook group um in the announcements it'll be pinned every day i'll post mm -hmm. a new one every day um, so today we've just, we're just asking people to comment with the best reefing advice that they've gotten. Mm -hmm. I'm going to randomly pick 10 winners tomorrow morning, right around 10 and then, uh, post a new one. And yeah, so hundred bucks a day. So almost 2,500 bucks. Damn. Nice. We've got some That's bigger, awesome. uh, bigger giveaways along the way too. We're going to, yep. you know, just kind of a group appreciation month. Mm -hmm. Certainly, That's pretty man. awesome. It's all about, you know, the, the community and, and, you know, helping each other. And it's, it's definitely um, we did it specifically for Aspirus TV because, I mean, that's Adam and I's baby for sure. Um, we mm -hmm. all help each other out, and we want to do something nice definitely through the holiday. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, there, there's there's more to it. There's other things that will come up, so make sure you <laughs> yeah. guys stay tuned. Um, so yeah. It's like the few months of giving. There's, like, so many awesome things the last, like, month or so. <laughs> and it's still more good, more, more good stuff that's to come. True. Yep. So what do, you, what do you think? Should we should we give away a gift card? I think we, we should. should. We should. <laughs> Now, the, the question is, do we do the random number? How do we make people enter to win? Give a reefing tip, random number? What do you think? I like the random the random aspect to it. Yep, I think I'm, that's I'm the, in for the random. Yeah, okay. it's the most fair. Why don't you tell them what, what's going on, though, Adam? What, what, they're gonna, yeah, what, what are, are they getting? Um, yeah, and door number one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we got we got a $100 promo code to BRS. Um, one lucky person's going to get it. Mm -hmm. um, just to know, it's... Uh, it's good. It's good. How long is it good for, Adam? 90 days? Until uh, the end of February. Okay, yes. so the end of February. So you've got three, um, almost three months to use it. Yeah, you got three months to use it. Uh, it's a one-time use, so you got to use the whole thing at one time. Um, and you enter in the promo code field. It's not like a gift certificate. It's it's a promo code. Um, mm -hmm. And you're, you're going to get the code. You know, uh, when we choose our winner, uh, we can just send it to you in a chat or an email. Um, and it's yours It's yours to use from then on out. So good luck to you all. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, so we got about 140 people currently. So one in 140. I'm gonna push it like three times. See where it lands. All right. So first one, the chat's gonna go crazy. I apologize. Uh, the first one to guess the number that is off screen on the random number generator. Between, Keep in mind, you have to pace one yourself. One. What, one and 140. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Because yeah. there's 140 people in the chat. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. So, dun, 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 take, dun, dun, take your dun, guess. Dun, dun. The first one I <laughs> see to take. do the right number. <laughs> Watch it take forever. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see, what one in. There's like that like 20, 30 second delay for YouTube, so I'm waiting for yeah. them to start pouring. Oh, we got one, 121, 38, 78, 17. <laughs> yep. Okay, they start scrolling fast. Ah. I was going to say, man, you got to keep your eyeballs on that. <laughs> I know. I'm actually trying really hard not to. There's been some close ones, but not quite there yet. I wish I could tell you guys to good luck, too, but everyone else will get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so hard. There's so many. Oh, there's been two super close ones. <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. It's like the wheel. Tick, 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 tick. It's funny. I see the same number of multiple, multiple times. Well, it's oh. tough. I mean, delays and stuff. Oh, no. Oh, there's been so no many one. so close. <laughs> <laughs> so close. There's been <sighs> the same number has been guessed. It's been like two away multiple times. Yeah. Adam, thanks for joining us tonight, man. It was yeah, fun. that's awesome. I'm really happy you came. That was awesome. I'm gonna make you do it again. <laughs> yeah, I'm in. <clears throat> Holy smokes! I'm surprised someone's got it yet. <laughs> oh, 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 oh! Ah, stop! I saw it somewhere. Six K. Okay, so the number was one hundred two for the random number generator, and sixty-nine Camaro. Looks like you're the one. I'm just quickly searching to make sure. Yep. All right. 69 Camaro. Congratulations. And nice car, by the way. <laughs> nice. Congratulations, buddy. Thanks awesome, for joining awesome. us.
on this awesome live stream. <laughs> I appreciate the extra BRS love for the, the bonus coupon card code. Yeah, man. Giveaway. No, thank you, BRS. <laughs> and um, thank you for inviting mm-hmm. us, man. Like I said, Adam, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, and thanks for all you guys for coming uh, come on the live stream and hanging out with us. Love it. Let's do one. <clears throat> all right. 69 Camaro, message me on Facebook, and then we will figure out how to get it to you. Absolutely. That's probably the easiest way. Ooh, okay, Adam. Thanks for coming on. We're gonna yeah, leave you in again. Absolutely. We should Robert? definitely do this again sometime. Heck yes. Are you in for next month? Robert and I are like monthly ish. Yeah. First okay. one's every month. Hey, he's in. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Committed. You heard it here. All right. All right. Audio awesome. goes. You guys all have a good night. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. Hope you guys enjoyed it. As always, if you did, hit that like button. If you're new, make sure.